I'm going to talk a little bit about the CEP, the, this project that we've been talking about, and then I'll turn it over to, uh, to Isabel. <clears throat> and we'll go on down the line and we'll come back at the end, as Tanya mentioned, to, uh, to drive home some of the points about how to get involved next week. So the Rewild Mission Bay project is a wetland restoration project. <clears throat> it is uh, uh, focused on Mission Bay, the northeast corner of Mission Bay in particular. And for me, I always think about this uh, geographically from a bird's eye view. That's the only bird pun I'll make today, but it's I have, obligatory, I have to put it in there. Uh, bird's eye view for me makes it really uh, real obvious the, the places that we're talking about and the things, the, the services, the processes, the endangered species that we're talking about and the communities that we're talking about. So <clears throat> on the screen here are a, are a nice progression of um, air photos from the 30s through the 40s to today. So on the right hand side is what we know and love as Mission Bay and then going backwards it goes back in time less than 100 years ago uh, so not that far back in time <clears throat> but you get a real obvious idea of how we have moved around the habitats and moved around the species and moved around the people in, in Mission Bay over time. In, in the 30s, the 40s, 50s, 60s especially, we did a lot of island building. We made a lot of the bay deeper. We made a lot of the shoreline sandy and riprap and were defined. So it's a lot less um, diverse in the habitats and the processes that uh, were there in the 30s and before that compared to now. <clears throat> it's an awesome recreation place there now. I've had birthday parties for my daughter there. We go there all, you know, once a week or so, so I love it. Uh, but what we're looking at here is, a, is the drastic change in the habitats and in, the, uh, in, in what's going on in Mission Bay over the last uh, 100 years. This has really important consequences for some of the species at the bottom here. Least terns, California least terns on the left. Nuttles lotus is a coastal sand dune plant on the, in the center. And Ridgeways rails is a, a, a chicken-like bird that lives in the marsh on the right. All of those birds and plants are endangered. <clears throat> the two birds are federally and state, state endangered because they rely on places just like Mission Bay in the 30s and have a lot less habitat that they need to survive um, in the picture on the right hand side. <clears throat> this map is from 1850, so this is still um, a, a map that reflects kind of um, recent history, the last 100, uh, 150 years, but it gives you an idea of what it has looked like for time immemorial. <clears throat> Uh, uh, lots of humans, Native American tribes, the Kumeyaay, uh, Ipai, and Tipai people were living along the banks of uh, Mission Beach and Crown Point and, and Mission Bay uh, for thousands and thousands and thousands of years while it looked something like this. So a lot of mudflat habitats and open water, a lot of tidal wetland habitats. And this gives you an idea about how humans can live alongside and can um, interact with a bay that looks a lot like it has pre-1930s, pre-1940s. They were doing it for thousands and thousands of years, for, for millennia. Um, so that's an important context as well when we talk about how far back are we thinking and what's changed in the last couple of decades versus what's been there for centuries. <clears throat> and here's a whole other view of, of Mission Bay. Uh, this is the, um, another map that I like to show here. It gives you an idea of what we thought it would look like in the future in the 40s and in the 50s. So this is a, an interesting map. There's a lot of green on there. There's a lot of space that was supposed to be devoted to habitat and to providing uh, habitats and recreation opportunities for humans. On the, on the right hand side, the left hand side looks a lot like what we, know, uh, what we know today. So there's been a lot of ideas and there's, like I mentioned, there's been a lot of earth moving around Mission Bay in the last couple of decades. <clears throat> we got a grant in 2014 to do the Rewild Mission Bay study. The San Diego Audubon Society got a grant from the Coastal Conservancy Fish and Wildlife Service, this feasibility study has been done for almost two years now. Uh, the feasibility study looked at some alternatives for wetland restoration, and they did that because the master plan, the Mission Bay Park master plan, has been calling for wetland restoration in the northeast corner of Mission Bay for 25 years, since, it, since the first master plan uh, was there, or since the 1994 master plan was there. So we were, we were saying that this feasibility study can bring about some of those goals and some of those ideas that were first put out there 25 years ago in the master plan. This report, um, it, a feasibility study, it's available for free on our website. If you have any problems finding it, just let me know. <clears throat> uh, and then to focus in on the Northeast Corner of Mission Bay, this hopefully looks or probably looks very familiar to many of you uh, out there, but, but maybe it's a, a habitat and a space that you don't know too well. This is the Northeast Corner of Mission Bay. Uh, on the right-hand side, going through the middle, that's Interstate 5, 
And then um, in the center is Rose Creek, the, the largest freshwater input to Mission Bay, uh, now that the San Diego River doesn't interact with Mission Bay. So this is the area that we looked at. This is also the same area that the city is looking at for their De Anza planning process. So there's an ongoing city-led um, CEQA process to design land uses in this area, and our study areas overlap purposefully. <clears throat> what we are advocating for, this is the, one, uh, one, of, the, um, one of the important slides, uh, uh, because it, it gives a visual for what we are advocating for. It's a wetland restoration project, as I said, we are saying that the northeast corner of Mission Bay here with the freshwater input from Rose Creek and the existing Kendall Frost Marsh is the best place in Mission Bay for a wetland restoration project. And so we really should be investing in this kind of habitat and this kind of restoration in this spot in particular. <clears throat> um, we'll talk about, we talk a lot about water quality improvements from wetland restorations, but Patrick will deal with that. We talk a lot about habitat improvements, which Isabel will, will focus on in her discussion. We talk a lot about access improvements, um, uh, spaces that we all can um, interact with the bay on our shared shoreline. That's another important piece. The only thing I'm gonna highlight here because for, for time reasons is just the sea level rise components of this. This is a page taken out of the city's report, sea level rise vulnerability assessment from last year. And it matches many of the sea level rise uh, bells that we've been ringing um, should be focused on uh, uh, land use planning for the next 50, 100 years that the city is doing. We really should be thinking about sea level rise resiliency here. So you can see with the graph or the, uh, <clears throat> the legend at the bottom, the yellower you get, the, the brighter green you get, the, the, <clears throat> the longer, uh, the higher it is off the ground. But two meters of sea level rise is a, is a realistic scenario for sea level rise. Um, and by 2100, and you can see just like all many, much of San Diego, just like much of, of the West Coast and the world, Mission Bay has lots of problems on the horizon for sea level rise. And we're talking about just this Northeast corner of Mission Bay and how to make that area more resilient. The only th other thing I wanna mention about resiliency is just that sea uh, uh, salt marshes, tidal wetlands, like we're talking about here um, for in Kendall Frost and a restoration area in the Rewild uh, Mission Bay project area, are excellent carbon sequesterers. So this marsh, this kind of habitat that we are looking about expanding here and restoring to a place that it once was, is that bar in the middle there, it's on par with mangroves, seagrass habitat as to how efficient it is at sequestering carbon. So that would be another fantastic benefit of this kind of habitat to, uh, as, as a way of not only adapting to sea level rise, but also helping in a little way to mitigate. So I'll jump now from that uh, just to a quick, uh, how did we get here in the last year? As Tommy said, this project's been going on for a while. The, uh, I just wanna highlight a few things. Um, so in 2020, um, uh, January 2020, earlier this year, it feels like decades ago, uh, but earlier this year, we got a majority of council members in the city of San Diego to prioritize funding for a new planning alternative. We wanna add a planning alternative that looks like this wildest wetland restoration scenario to the existing planning process. So in January, a majority of council members agreed with that. <clears throat> in, um, in July, the city uh, proposed this supplemental environmental program, uh, which we'll talk more about, uh, to create a new planning alternative, to fund that alternative that the city council members uh, asked for. And then next week is a vote be before the water board in which the city, uh, the city will put forth its proposal and the water board will determine if they uh, approve it or not. So that's what we're all driving towards is to get the water board to um, approve this supplemental environmental project, this SEP um, that, we're, that we are pushing for. Um, <clears throat> I'll go into a couple of details about the SEP. So the city's proposal uh, to the water board <clears throat> includes three parts. So uh, one of them is physical habitat restoration at Kendall Frost Marsh. Uh, another piece is technical studies needed for wetland restoration in Mission Bay. Those are things like wave studies and erosion studies. Um, and then the third piece, which we'll focus most on, uh, for this discussion at least, is this new planning alternative in the ongoing city-led process. So that's what we asked for. That's the main thing that we have been um, excited about this uh, set opportunity is that it would fund a new alternative to go before city council. Um, the new plan in the details here, this is one of my most boring slides because it's a picture of a picture of a document, but um, uh, the, uh, this plan here that's outlined in, a do in this document with several more pages, it says that we will, the city will fund a new and equally analyzed alternative to the, to the um, existing alternative the city has been working on. 
And importantly, it says that that new alternative will include 80 acres of tidal marsh, new 80 restored acres of tidal marsh by 2100, and it will use sea level rise model. That's a new, that's a new um, component to this, and that's fantastic. It also says, the third bullet there, that it will maximize implementable wetland restoration reflected of existing feasibility studies. And that's great because we have a feasibility study. We have just such a study here um, that shows that a large wetland restoration, a substantial wetland restoration uh, is feasible here and talks about the opportunities and the benefits to human and uh, natural communities. Um, it also refocuses the project on water quality improvement which is um, uh, absolutely reasonable and, and excellent that the water board is focusing on that. Importantly, it does not include any information about what the rest of the park will look like, what the area surrounding this restored wetland will look like. <clears throat> um, and that's uh, something that many of us have been talking about. Many of the community groups have weighed in as, as to what they wanna see in the rest of the park. And this step uh, proposal doesn't talk about what the city will, will put into the rest of the, the park that borders this larger wetland. So that <clears throat> is uh, an important component of what we'll work on after the 14th if the water board were to approve it. So for the three years that this set funds the city to create a new alternative, Rewild Coalition will keep advocating, sharing the information about it. The mayor certainly and the city council will have a lot of leadership opportunity and a lot of, uh, a lot of power over what the rest of the park looks like um, in this uh, planning alternative that the city's planning staff will, will put in put in place. <clears throat> so it's an opportunity for us to all um, raise our voices and not the sea level rise, as this sign in the middle here says, uh, um, raise your voice, not the sea level. Um, <clears throat> that's it for me. The last thing I wanted to just say is that we've been talking, uh, certainly, hopefully you've, you've seen us walking around with giant posters or, or on Zoom meetings in the last several months, um, talking with groups uh, just like this, talking with groups that, that you know, I'd be happy to talk more in detail. Like I said, we are building this rewild coalition of supporters that are saying that Focusing on wetland restoration for all of its water quality, sea level rise resilience, uh, and improvements to access for indigenous communities and all San Diegans is the right way to go. This is the opportunity and this is the place to seize it. So I will pass it back to Tommy to uh, head off to the next component. Thanks. <clears throat> thank you very much. And oops, um, thank you very much. And well done, Andrew. And, and let's not be too hard on the boring documents, too, because I know Patrick has to look at a lot of those boring documents sometimes. Um, and we're going to hear from Patrick in, um, in just a moment. But first of all, I want to introduce um, Isabel Kay, who I've, I've, it's been really great getting to know Isabel during my time working at, uh, at, at Rewild the last 18 months or so. And, um, and Isabel works as the uh, UC San Diego Natural Reserve Systems Reserves Manager. So when you go over to Kendall Frost, She's often the, uh, the happy face you see greeting you there. So, uh, Isabel, I'm, I'm turning it over to you. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so, here is an aerial view of the Kendall Frost Marsh Reserve. And I should say that um, our property, and I'm sorry I didn't put a map in showing this, but technically the Kendall Frost Marsh Reserve, which um, is part of the University of California's natural reserve system, a statewide system of now 41 um, reserves, um, is only the upper part of the marsh. And the lower part of the marsh is actually um, the city of San Diego's property. But over the years, we've come to manage them as one, um, you know, as one unit, which has been great. We have great relations with um, the park rangers, the people on the ground. And um, anyway, so this is um, a map, I mean, an aerial view showing some key um, points on that you can see here, including um, the original um, route for Rose Creek, which uh, no longer flows in there, thanks to the fill, the fill in the foreground. What? what? Sorry, um, no. the fill in the foreground is actually I want to hear them. city property also, and um, that is is supposed to be an extension to the it Northern Wildlife Preserve, which is the technical term for the city's portion of this wetland. You can also see here the Stribley Marsh um, restoration project. Um, I'm pointing this out because when we start to do restoration, we want to keep in mind that 
how it's done is very important. You can't really just excavate fill and then um, have everything go just perfectly. The hydrology is very important. Um, the level that you excavate to everything else. Um, and there's some lessons learned from that project. Um, anyway, we could go to the next slide. Um, so here is just a view of the many, many, many species that exist in this, in this uh, marsh, in this wetland, um, which is just really incredible from um, the red-shouldered hawks and um, Har Cooper's hawks to um, peregrine falcons, of course their prey, which are some of the birds that um, are resident in the marsh and also migratory birds, um, as well as the more uh, elusive birds like the Sora, of course many of you will have seen um, ospreys. And it's really remarkable how such a small area of working, functioning ecosystem can actually support so many species. And of course, the birds are just the obvious tip of the iceberg. A very complex food web supports this wildlife. And this is why we want these studies done um, to help us understand what's going on um, as a, a baseline and an underpinning for the restoration that we hope will occur um, in the near future. As you might have heard, but um, some people say that in the LA basin, the sky was so thick with birds, you couldn't see the sun when they flew past. So we have to remember that we've had um, our shifting baselines and that there are people who are still alive today who remember densities of birds here. Um, and that's what we sort of have to keep in mind and not just settle for what we have now. Next, please. Um, among the more um, fa famous <laughs> um, species, we have the Ridgeways rail. And the reason I'm showing this um, is that they are absolutely dependent on the tidal salt marsh. And um, you can see here uh, some of these birds raising chicks and um, their incredible parents. And um, you can see that um, they feed their chicks, and a lot of the time you can see evidence of their feeding in the marsh. But unfortunately, we have to micromanage all of these species because the system doesn't support them at the moment. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, you can see what actually Andrew has showed you before. The, um, the context that we're keeping in mind was that there was a much larger extent of wetland and that wetland was also in the context of um, uplands that buffered them and, um, you know, related to them and are very important in the future. So just having a wetland with a with riprap around it is, is not what we're looking for. Um, so what we have left, left is 0.1%. Um, next slide is, um, how some of this micromanagement that we have to um, carry out in order to keep these birds here. Um, in the top, you can see a map on these little yellow triangles are the locations of um, rafts. There's a picture of one on the right there that are uh, provided for the rails to be able to nest. The cord grass is no longer tall enough and dense enough um, to support um, their nests that should be woven among the stems of the cord grass and they should float up and down with the tides. But um, the cord grass isn't dense enough or, or sturdy enough and now the, and the, the nests that were, are built in that um, existing cord grass just get flooded and float away. Um, and so here you can see in the lower left this is the release of captive bread rails um, that were released last year in order to help the population um, to have a balanced sex ratio because there were too many males and all the birds that were released that time were females. And in fact, um, I, in the video that is um, shown here, I'm not sure if it can go full screen, maybe not. Um, 
the, here are six ticks that um, the adults raised and they really used um, a couple of the rafts, moving them between them. And you can see there's a band on the, actually there's bands on both legs of the adult on the lower right corner. So they're, all this active management as a, is a crucial part to keeping the population going, but it's not really what we want. We also have predator control. So that picture of that white cat there uh, is emblematic. We catch a lot of um, cats, but also um, rats um, and uh, opossums, raccoons. And um, it's actually pretty heartbreaking. Um, opossums are not native, but raccoons are native. And to be playing Sophie's Choice, to be fearful of um, peregrine falcons when they fly over, or some of these raptors that need the wetlands to survive, but we are protecting the rails, so now we want to take them out. Same with the raccoons. So our hope is to get a functioning system in place where we don't have to micromanage. Next slide, please. Um, so here uh, are some figures that were produced by um, I have a graduate um, class at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Study the effects of um, 20 centimeters, 50 centimeters, and 150 centimeters of sea level rise. And you can see that with um, sea level rise of um, under five feet, which is 150 centimeters, which is now a conservative estimate, the entire Kendall Frost Marsh will go underwater. So where is this, how are we going to respond to that? We have to start doing something about this. And that's why um, I've been concerned about this um, since the writing of the the master plan for Mission Bay when um, Jim Pugh of the Audubon Society and myself and Joyce Edler really pushed for wetland restoration um, between the existing marsh and Rose Creek to reestablish um, some more natural processes. Um, oh, and in the upper part of this figure, it shows um, the two species that are both endangered. Um, and how they use the habitat. Really, the Belding Savannah Sparrow is in dire straits even now because the um, cord grass is moving up slope as predicted, and the high marsh, mid to high marsh habitat of perennial pickleweed that the Belding Savannah Sparrow depends on is being pushed out of the at the pushed out of the marsh entirely because there's no way for nowhere for it to migrate to. Next, please. So there's some ways to counteract um, sea level rise. And really, the natural processes are for plants to grow um, and to trap sediment and to build the marsh with inputs of storm water and fresh water. But that um, source of sediments and nutrients is missing in this system because camp land is, in, is between the marsh and Rose Creek, which is a major source of um, essential inputs. Next, please. Oops. Oh, yeah, see, it's not there. There's a red X. Um, so the consequences of this missing um, sediment can be seen. These are um, uh, pictures that were gathered together by a student of mine. And over the years, this area in red, which is just one of the areas, um, has become a bare, barren um, part of the marsh. And that means that there's no, there, the plants are not growing there. They're not fixing carbon into the subsurface in their roots and then um, held in place um, thanks to the anaerobic soils. And on the left, you can see um, one is the site on the right. Um, it's what the ground level view looks like. This is not a healthy looking marsh. And uh, two is looking to the east towards camp land. Next, please. I think this is my last slide. Um, sorry, I'm going a little bit over. So you can see the original location of Rose Creek. We're probably not going to reestablish that original creek, but 
we really feel that connect by removing Campland, which is um, you've seen in previous figures, it's just right there in the um, in the uh, lower middle foreground. Um, and connecting Rose Creek through that area will really help um, remedy some of these issues. So we're really, really um, pushing for the SEP and uh, the overall rewild plan. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Isabel. Appreciate it. And uh, moving right along, we wanna make some time for um, some questions and, and answers as well, but we wanna hear from some more of our guests, including, um, Patrick McDonough from San Diego Coast Keeper. And, uh, and Patrick, we're, we're thrilled to have you joining us. And uh, Coast Keeper has been doing such a great job for years and years and years doing water quality control testing and, and really handling a lot of um, uh, litigation work when necessary to ensure that uh, our water remains clean and healthy here in the San Diego area. So thank you for all the great work you're doing. And the floor is yours, Patrick. All right, thank you for the intro. Um, yeah, my name is, in fact, Patrick McDonough. I'm a staff attorney with San Diego Coast Keeper. Um, we can go to the next slide. Is, is Andrew working the controls back there? Cool. I'll just assume that's a yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, as a brief bit of background for, for Coast Keeper, for anyone who's not aware, um, we're a grassroots nonprofit that protects and restores our region's waterways through a multifaceted approach using, we don't just engage in litigation. Um, we engage in education, outreach, and engagement, uh, science, and advocacy. And we take a holistic watershed approach. So while we're a coast keeper in name, our work focuses on everything inland as well, all of our lakes, streams, creeks, and all the policies that affect the entire region, not just the coast, because, and I want to emphasize this, everything is interrelated and connected. Um, which has already come up numerous times in this presentation. I don't want to drone on too much, um, but yeah, it's it's very. The, the last presentation was very informative, and I'm sure I'll touch on some of that as we go through this. Um, I personally, as an attorney, am engaged with uh, a lot of our ad advocacy efforts, trying to make sure the environmental concerns are considered in the decision making process, and we often align with. Audubon in those efforts. And as was mentioned, we engage in litigation when necessary. It's a lot of Clean Water Act um, enforcement. And through that, we've actually been able to fund Audubon with um, some significant funding over the past few years. So we've got a great partnership and thanks for having me here. Um, quick roadmap. We're going to talk about how and why pollution ends up in our coastal water bodies and how our water is currently managed and why that's a problem. And then also discuss some of the solutions, including Rewild Mission Bay and uh, other green infrastructure. We can go to the next slide. So let's dive into it. We'll do a quick crash course on urban runoff pollution, which is the number one threat to water quality in our region. Um, so this is the Rose Creek watershed. Every drop of water that falls or flows within this area drains to Mission Bay via Rose Creek, which is I mean, we've already seen the maps right where the Rewild Mission Bay project is proposed. Unfortunately, Rose Creek is an extremely polluted water body uh, and sampling in Mission Bay and specifically right at the mouth of Rose Creek and near Camp Land consistently shows that some of the highest bacteria levels in any water body in the county, um, they're, they're regularly right there. Um, and there are also water quality advisories issued warning the public not to swim there or go in the water more frequently than almost anywhere else in the county, which is obviously a problem. So where does all this pollution come from? Well, first of all, it's not just bacteria. It comes from a variety of sources, um, some of which are listed up here. So there's the large Marine Corps Air Station Miramar right next door to that. You have the, the massive Miramar landfill, which is owned and operated by the city of San Diego. There are numerous other industrial facilities in this area and in this watershed that handle fertilizers or use fertilizers. Uh, there's composting operations, aggregate mining, cement manufacturing, scrap metal recycling, um, a number of different uh, activities and land uses that contribute a variety of pollutants such as pathogens and, bac and bacteria, but also excess nutrients that cause algal blooms, can deplete oxygen, choke out ecosystems and cause fish die-offs and can also be toxic to humans, uh, carcinogens and toxic metals. I also have a note on this slide that 
the waterways parallel I-5 and State Route 52. So you have Rose Canyon paralleling I-5 and San Clemente Creek Canyon paralleling the 52. And there are a lot of pollutants um, that accumulate on those surfaces as well from cop uh, copper dust from old brake pads, as well as microplastics from the from tire wear uh, accumulate on the surfaces. And during storms or any rain events, pollutant all the pollutants that I just mentioned are washed off of those surfaces and into our creeks and streams and ev like eventually Mission Bay and all of our coastal waters. And that's why you shouldn't swim or surf for 72 hours after it rains, which we're trying to change that. Everyone in San Diego just accepts that as fact, and that's a problem. Um, so next slide. Thank you. Um, development in impervious surfaces. Uh, so, so there are several issues at play here. And first, impervious surfaces exacerbate many of these problems. So this map just shows that uh, everything west of I-15 is pretty developed, and there's a lot of impervious surfaces in those areas. Um, next slide. So, and, and why is that important? Well, prior to development, when it rained, much of water that was falling from the sky could be absorbed and infiltrated into the ground and then become part of our groundwater and our water table. Um, and not nearly as much water would be diverted and run off into streams and rivers. The natural process of um, the slower flow rate and less runoff and infiltration acts as a filtration system and significantly reduces pollutant loads into our waterways. Um, and because we have so much development in this watershed and really throughout San Diego, we're trying to restore natural features uh, or implement more of what is term termed green infrastructure to help improve our water quality. And the Rewild project is a perfect example of that type of green infrastructure. Um, next slide, I think that you're going to pop up. Sorry, yeah. the flow rate, you know, it rains when there's impervious surfaces, that little spike shows. Uh, well, actually, we'll talk about that. So continue to the next slide. Um, this happens. So this is just a quick visual of something that happens every wet season. And again, because we've paved over so much of the natural landscape, uh, water cannot infiltrate into the ground. It has to go somewhere. And that's why we see these flashy high flow rates over a short period of time that cause flooding and green infrastructure and the removal of impervious surfaces helps to prevent this. Uh, next slide. Uh, sorry, yeah, we got the couple images that pop up. I don't, sorry, I'm not great with PowerPoint. I apologize for the surprise, a, a visual comes up. Um, so these are a couple more visuals showing that with impervious surfaces, you get pollutants are efficiently carried to our water bodies because they cannot infiltrate or be filtered out by natural processes. And the picture of that, of scouring, um, shows that impervious surfaces divert much higher than natural volumes into our urban canyons. Um, and this contributes to scouring and accelerated erosion. And that photo, that's actually like 10 to 15 feet deep of scouring in one of the urban canyons. Um, and there are many of those urban canyons within the Rose Creek watershed. And this can be very dangerous to infrastructure. Uh, it can cause flooding and also destroys ecosystems by removing excess sediment uh, from upstream locations, which and then moving them downstream at uh, an unnatural rate that can choke out downstream ecosystems. Um, and these, again, these are problems within the Rose Creek watershed, but we see these everywhere, unfortunately, through San Diego County. Uh, next, this is just an example of an industrial facility. And as you can imagine, when rain falls on this, it will mobilize numerous pollutants, including toxic metals, which then flow downstream into our waterways. Uh, next. So this is uh, gross, but very important. And we're trying to beat the drum to make everybody aware of this because it's kind of uh, some new science. So in addition to all the pollutants that I've just discussed, there's also bacteria from human fecal matter everywhere. And no, nobody misheard that. Um, it's not just from wildlife and the vast majority is not from uh, the homeless population. Studies are finding that it's likely from sewage exfiltrating or, or leaching out of our aging wastewater infrastructure. So basically the sewer system and into our stormwater infrastructure and the environment. Um, how does that work? Well, sorry, this is next slide, please. Um, well, first there are, there are two different systems. There's public utilities and stormwater and they're very separate departments and they don't necessarily communicate with each other. Stormwater is managed strictly as a liability. All stormwater infrastructure is to 
prevent flooding and channel rainwater to the ocean as quickly as possible. And because of that, it's not treated. It just flows directly to the ocean, just like all the signs on storm drains indicate. Wastewater is supposed to go to the treatment plant. However, these new studies are finding that significant amounts of raw sewage is escaping our wastewater system. And that's likely due to uh, aging infrastructure. Um, and that raw sewage is getting into the stormwater system, which are frequently uh, run parallel, like in this image, to the, the, the sanitary sewer system. So you have the storm sewer system and the sanitary sewer system. They typically run parallel. And when raw sewage gets into the stormwater, then it is discharged into our environment without any treatment. And that's obviously a problem. Um, next slide, please. Um, and this is just an image showing the wastewater infrastructure and stormwater infrastructure. The yellow is wastewater. If everyone can see this, it might be a, a bit small, but um, the blue, you can see it intermingles and can parallel with the yellow. Um, and that's where your exfiltration happens. And we get all of this uh, raw human waste just coming into our natural environment. I also want to emphasize that there are dry weather flows. Everything that I've talked about is not only a problem when it rains. Yes, it is a huge problem when it rains, but there are also uh, plenty of those uh, no swim warnings, especially in camp land during dry weather events. And that's, that's kind of a story for another day as well, but everyone should be aware that this is not only a problem um, when it rains. So next slide, please. Okay, so what are the solutions to all these problems <laughs> that I've been harping about? Um, well, there's no silver bullet and I really could speak for an hour about institutional administrative changes and how we should start treating stormwater as an asset rather than a liability and capture some of that stormwater, treat it to reduce the pollutant loads and also provide some of our local water supply. That's again, a story for another day. I could, again, that's a long story, but regardless, one important element of the suite of solutions that are necessary are multi-benefit uh, green infrastructure projects like Rewild Mission Bay. So yes, as has been discussed, Rewild will restore critical habitats um, to all of our critters, but it, but it also provides numerous additional benefits. That's hence these multi-benefit solutions. And if we're investing in these, you get more bang for your buck. So it's reducing pollutant loads into one of the most intensely used recreational waters in San Diego, which is also an environmental justice issue as people from communities who don't have coastal access uh, frequently recreate in and around Mission Bay, particularly, um, sorry, it also provides green space uh, and beautifies the communities. It provides educational opportunities for the public to learn about everything that we've been discussing tonight, and it also creates green jobs in the process. And frankly, we need more of these projects throughout the region, including in upstream areas, and really any development or redevelopment plan plans should be incorporating these types of green infrastructure projects. But Rewild in particular is a huge opportunity because it's a, it's a flagship project that can hopefully turn a corner and shift attitudes and awareness of both the public, but also our local decision makers regarding these green infrastructure multi-benefit solutions. And that's why it's so important, so important to support the SEP. So with that, I'll turn it back to you guys and thanks for listening. Hey, thank you very much, Patrick. That was uh, uh, a lot of good information and part of there. And uh, yeah, you know, what, to one of Patrick's, you know, prime points, I mean, we spent a lot of time here in the city talking about um, finding ways to capture stormwater runoff. And we talk about it in terms of these giant capital projects that involve pouring a lot of concrete. And, and really uh, a project and a proposal like Rewild Mission Bay is the other side of that. It's the green infrastructure that we had there 150 years ago that has been withered away over time. And it does those very, very same things that we spend unbelievable amounts of money to construct. So this is a, a wonderful example of green infrastructure too. And, and thank you, Patrick, for, uh, for emphasizing that point as well as your um, uh, additional points too. So I wanna turn things over real quickly to our final presenter and then we'll uh, uh, start answering some questions. I see that Isabel is, is answering some of these that are coming up in the chat, which is wonderful. Uh, we'll get to some of your questions too. I know someone just asked if we're gonna have some, uh, some talking points. I'll post it again. The, um, uh, the one sheet that I posted when we began has some of the basic talking points on there. We'll go over some of those after Karina speaks. 
and I'll drop that into the chat one more time so you can pull that up in one of your windows. But um, Karina Ornelas came to us from the uh, uh, San Diego City College Audubon Club, and she's currently working as the uh, San Diego Audubon Otay Valley Planting Coordinator. And you may recall, she was the one who was really behind the uh, Maripo Mariposas y uh, Monarchas presentation that we did over the summer, which uh, was really well attended as well. So thank you if you joined us for that. And I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Karina, you've got the floor. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So the San Diego Regional Board Meeting is next Wednesday, October 14, and I am. The Regional Water Quality Control Board will make its final determination on the city proposed supplemental environment project set. The set in mitigation for every sewage spill in the Tecolote Creek that fed water quality in Mission Bay. So this Wednesday, you have the opportunity to be part of, of this by speaking. So to speak during the meeting, please submit a virtual speaker card by completing the owner registration form, but you have till 8.30 a.m. on the day of the board meeting. Also, you want to listen and, and just not make a comment, you can watch it on the webcast. And also, don't forget to share this on social media using hashtag for wild mission bay and six comments. Mm. Next, please. <laughs> So also we have this Rewayo virtual backgrounds to share so people can use it during their comments. And also the 44 members of the organization of Rewayo Coalition are in support for cleaner water in Mission Bay, spending public access to our bayfront, greater habitat for vulnerable and traded species that will vanish as sea level rise more quickly, the habitats can mitigate and species can adapt salt marshes and coastal wetland serves an excellent source of natural carbon sequestration. Expanding wetlands in Northern Mission Bay provides greater resilience to climate change and rising sea levels. The opportunity to improve and our environment just in companies to speak experience and relative to the era lengthy history of indigenous use. Thank you. Look at that coalition growing every single day. Thank you, Karina. Great job. Thank you for including uh, some of those um, uh, critical talking points, which, uh, you know, I, uh, I can't emphasize enough are, are particularly good if you only have 60 seconds to, to make some kind of a comment. Um, you know, the cleaner water we have found to be really above all else, the, the most um, resonating uh, talking point of all of these. People are concerned about clean water. Patrick mentioned about the, the volume of, of dirty and foul water, not just on the beach, but also in the bay. Um, expanded public access to our bayfronts, a greater habitat for vulnerable and threatened species. You know, the, the sea levels are gonna be rising so quickly that a lot of these species, plants and animals, are not gonna be able to adapt in time before those sea levels rise and they have to move on. Uh, promoting efficient carbon sequestration, um, expanding wetlands, and, um, and the opportunities to improve and add environmental justice components as well. And so, um, Andrew, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you as well, and also uh, uh, Jennifer, but we have some questions that have been cropping up that I know um, uh, uh, Isabel's been trying to answer thus far. Um, is there anything that you wanted to make some remarks on before we get into the Q&A? Thanks, Tommy. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks, everybody, for the awesome questions. So there was, uh, I'm, I uh, haven't been, I've been working, working the visual part and not reading the chats. Uh, but <clears throat> I know that um, uh, Frank asked about written comments. So the city proposed this, um, this SEP uh, in July. There was uh, more, a little bit more than 30 days for written comments. They were due by August 10th. Um, and there is a staff member from the water board here. Um, on the 14th, there are ways to public to offer a public comment. Um, but Kiara, if you have anything to add about whether they are can be written or not, that would be great. I think, like I said though, that um, written comments were due um, in early August, unfortunately. Yeah. So, um, I'll, and I also followed the chat, and I can touch on a couple of questions. Um, Written comment period did close and we provided responses to comments. Um, so that opportunity has passed. You can always either read your written comments into the record orally, or you can ask the board to make an exception and accept it into the written record. Um, but sometimes that means delaying the hearing so that all written comments can be considered. 
Um, the speakers, each speaker, it's not 60 seconds. I think each speaker has three minutes. And if you don't need your three minutes, uh, you can cede your time to uh, another speaker. So you can, uh, this, for anyone that has a letter to read into the record. Um, and uh, okay, so you guys have the link to speaking. What were some of the other questions that I may have forgotten to answer? Well, certainly the deadline for, for written comments was, uh, was one of the questions that came up, but also it's good to know that there's three minutes to, to give oral testimony, and I assume that's whether you're on the telephone or whether you're uh, participating on, on the Zoom discussion. Correct. Okay. As long as you're registered. And, and when you register, you can put that into the comment box that says, I wish to cede my time to whoever else, you know, my, my extra time. And one other thing um, that I would like to share if I can is a, a lot of the comments we received were uh, things that I, I fully support, the, the Water Board Prosecution Team fully supports, but were of a certain level of detail that weren't necessary to get the SEP approved. Uh, so a lot of those written comments, I really, my goal is to get this approved before our board so that the city can start um, doing or following through on the planning process and and, uh, and the restoration work. But uh, the city following through on the planning process means there will be additional steps along the way so that you guys can provide comments on which alternative to select, what the details of that alternative should include, such as um, uh, carbon sequestration, et cetera. It, it couldn't be funded with the SEP that's currently proposed but we hope that through your comments and continued participation in the city's CEQA process, a lot of that work will still get some discussion and consideration with this directly with the city. Okay, um, thank you. And um, Andrew or Jennifer, why don't we go back one slide in Karina's presentation, go back to those talking points that, uh, that she included, or we can go and put up, um, uh, yeah, great. And that way, you know, if you're, if you're dialing in, you can uh, maybe screenshot that or just mentally uh, recall some of those particular bullet points, because those are some of the ones that we've really been using, like I've been saying, for the last 18 months, two years. They're good basic talking points, but understanding that we have three minutes each to go and make a presentation, uh, you, you have more than enough time to really cover all of these. Uh, I'll say again real quickly, too, that the um, one sheet that I uh, included and that I linked here, and I'll drop it again in the chat, that has the agenda for, uh, uh, it has the link to get onto the Zoom link for the uh, Water Quality Control Board meeting next week, the link if you want to participate on the phone as well, and the details regarding the entire city's SEP proposal if you wanna um, uh, spend time with that too. So I'll drop that back into the chat and I'll address this one question and I'll bring you in on this too, Andrew. Um, is any of this in the city's climate action plan? Any of this specifically being, and I would assume, the um, the rewild proposal, and I believe that the climate action plan predates uh, the rewild proposal by a couple of years. Yeah, thanks, uh, Tommy, and thanks, Kiara, for all the information. So the city of San Diego is just about to start or is starting the next version of the climate action plan. Five years ago, the first version of the climate action plan was groundbreaking and, and great in a lot of ways. Uh, one of the ways it wasn't so great, and we hope to improve that in the next version, is that it's strategies for uh, talking about the natural infrastructure and, and habitats that, that exist on city property and that the city has management control over. Um, they're not in there in any way that would benefit the city for their carbon sequestration. So strategies that involve habitat are, are almost um, solely focused on urban street trees. And, and, and trees in the city, which are fantastic and critical, uh, but they're missing a lot of components. And, and in this case, with this particular uh, rewild Mission Bay project, they're missing components that do actually sequester carbon and um, could benefit the city in its climate action plan, in its, in its monitoring and in its meeting its goals. They're just not in there yet. So we're hoping to, to encourage the city. I know lots of other groups are, are talking about other other components in addition to wetland restoration that have a carbon sequestration component that the city could improve as well. So that particular piece about how the city manages and, and um, manages, restores, and purchases land 
um, should be something that would that the climate action plan uh, engages with this this time around. We're hoping that it does. Um, good question. Yeah, and Tommy has been excellent um, in our um, in our Rewild Mission Bay website. So the points here that Karina made and and in the slide before those links to um, how to register and how to make a comment at the SEP next week are all in that one page that's on our website. Thanks, Karina, for making those um, making those visual here. They're on the one sheet that Tommy's put into the Zoom chat, and they're on our website, rewildmissionbay.org, as well. Um, uh, no, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Andrew. I'm sorry. I was no. I was just going to pass it over to um, Patrick for a question about composting. Um, so um, uh, Padma and Sri were asking about the composting operations and how they how they impact um, water quality, even though they might also be doing something fantastic like composting. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We like composting. It does provide an environmental service. Um, again, topic for another day to get into landfills and our waste habits, but. Um, Composting, had, there's there's a lot of bacteria and potentially other pollutants involved when it is mobilized by stormwater. So if it's managed properly, great. Um, but if stormwater is coming into contact with any of the composting operations um, and then leaving the property, then it's getting into our waterways and it's coming downstream and it's going to end up in Mission Bay. So that's where uh, I was generally mentioning potential sources of pollution throughout the watershed that, you know, I've worked on or seen, or these are the concerns that Coast Keepers had. So, um, yeah, it's just but one example, but yeah, I'm not trying to shut down uh, composts, uh, composting operations or say that they're bad. They just, uh, there's a significant pollutant load potential um, with regard to storm water. Hi, uh, so I wonder if I could... Um, it's, I have 726 right now, but I, I do want to go a few extra minutes because we have some additional questions that I want to make sure that um, uh, that we get answered and that we address while we have everyone on the line. And one of them that uh, came in earlier was, uh, is there any interest in seagrass restoration as part of the rewilding plan or in calculating how much carbon could be sequestered by restoration? And we've talked a bit about carbon sequestration over the last few months. and. Um, as an old forest warrior, I was highly unaware that uh, 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 coast salt marshes do a much better job of sequestering carbon than, than forests. But um, uh, Andrew or, or Isabel, would you be able to comment on, uh, on seagrass restoration or Karina? Isabel, I'll, I'll take the first stab if you want. Um, the, uh, that's a great question. Um, as Tommy just mentioned, our seagrass habitats do have also a fantastic job of sequestering carbon as well as providing habitat for fish and vertebrates and what eats those fish? Birds, for sure. So, um, so they're great for birds. Um, South San Diego Bay, San Diego Bay, Mission Bay have a lot of, sea, of eelgrass habitat and it's one of the, one of the best components of, for why these areas are so important to birds up the food chain um, as well as everything um, down the food chain farther than that. So they are uh, definitely of concern to us as sea levels rise, the, uh, the, where those eel grasses are, where that, that kind of habitat can survive changes. The deeper it is, um, the harder it is for enough light to get down there for those plants to grow. So the sea level rise um, and, and warming of the water, climate change components like that will affect where seagrass goes. Many organizations, including Audubon Society before, before my time have made sure that um, see, uh, eelgrass restoration events have ha happen if there's any kind of dredging or any kind of um, effect to some of the underwater habitats like that. So it's one of the things that's on many of our regulatory agencies' radars already. Uh, but um, in addition to eelgrass habitats, um, coastal wetlands are, are also very good at sequestering carbon. The Rewild Mission Bay Project will be focusing on restoring some of those habitats. Um, and not making, not focusing as much on the shallow subtitle habitats that eelgrasses are. There's, al there's already a lot of that in, uh, in Mission Bay already. So, uh, Isabel, do you want to add anything more to that? I could just add that um, as sea level rises, presumably there will be somewhere for the seagrass beds to migrate to. They will probably migrate onto what is currently mudflats, and the mudflats will migrate to where we now have cord grass that is the major habitat for um, the rails. Um, the cord grass is migrating upslope already in Kendall Frost Marsh um, into areas that 
were dominated by pickle weeds and um, that the belding savanna sparrows use and the, the belding savanna sparrows don't have anywhere to go. So I think the important thing is to realize that right now the critical um, issue is to deal with um, the ability for the existing uh, suite of, of intertidal habitats to be able to survive, you know, for the next, you know, indefinite period. Um, and it seems like the eelgrass, while it, it will get drowned in its lower depths probably, um, also keeping the water cleaner allows the eelgrass to grow deeper. So um, what Patrick was um, addressing, you know, could also help very much with that as with the rehold, rewild restoration probably will help with uh, water clarity. But um, it's not in this particular location, the most sort of urgent need, but it's a good point that it does a good job of sequestering carbon as well. Um, Andrew and Isabel and Karina, let me pose this uh, question as well. Uh, you know, if uh, the uh, the SEP proposal is approved by the Regional Water Quality Control Board next week, could you could you please explain to to everyone here what exactly that means for uh, for Rewild and how that really does move the ball down the field? Uh, what what are things going to look like once we get an approval of this SEP proposal? Should I, should I go just because I was talking? Um, I just wanted to say that um, I didn't mention it in my, um, during my presentation, but what the, the SEP does for the Kennel Frost Marsh Reserve um, is it, first of all, proposes to take, um, to collect data that will help us learn about how, what is missing um, from the ecosystem functions in the existing reserve and perhaps why it's not doing well. Um, but it also is going to be able to implement some um, sort of on the ground improvements um, that um, can be done pretty easily like um, moving some of the fences so that the wetlands don't actually cross the fences. So moving the wet, some of the fences out of the wetlands, removing old fencing, helping us with um, invasive plant species control. So some really needed, but um, sort of easy, almost low hanging fruit to be able to um, make some immediate improvements um, around the candle frost marsh itself. Um, and then of course, being able to support the larger wetland where we hope or the existing kettle frost marsh will be able to migrate to is another very important part. Andrew, you want to add to that? Um, yeah, uh, just there was a slide in here that had a little bit of the timeline piece, but um, we're focusing on October 14th, obviously, as um, the water board is, is going to de debate and determine the fate of the city set proposal. But after that, if, it, if they decide to um, approve it, um, Isabel said there'll be some components that physically restore, begin to restore some of Kendall Frost Marsh or continue to restore some of Kendall Frost Marsh. There'll be some studies that the city undertakes that are valuable to wetland restoration throughout the Bay. And then there'll be this new alternative that the city staff will work on creating. That will come to city council and, and city council will choose whether they, which options they wanna go with. A lot, a lot of the, uh, the idea is that it'd be pretty similar to what they did in Fiesta Island, where there were some options before city council and city council chose which option they wanted. Um, but between then and now, certainly there's a whole lot that I feel like we need to make sure is front and center in terms of advocacy for city staff as they go along and, and make these, um, this new alternative. If we wanna talk about what the rest of the park um, could include or should include, if we wanna talk about some of the details that Isabel brought up about topography and, and habitat components for the restoration. We want to talk about um, the importance of water quality and, and uh, different options for how water quality should be filtered as it moves through and around the wetland. Then those are the kinds of things that we will uh, have, have, have in, embrace or engage city council or city and city staff on how to make sure that those are obvious needs from the Rewild Coalition and, and the local communities. Definitely a lot of local committees like the PB Town Council, the Claremont Town Council, the PB Planning Group, the 
uh, ocean beach committees have weighed in on what they would like to see in, in, in the rest of the park. In addition to wetland restoration, they have lots of ideas as they should about what other land uses should, have, should be there. And we hope to engage the city on um, those topics in the coming years as the city plans for this space. Yeah, and that's one of the, the really important things to remember about uh, the interaction between <laughs> elected officials and, and what we're trying to do here with, with Rewild. You know, we are up against the clock. We don't, we're not able to sort of put something on the shelf and say, well, we'll get to this later. Um, we're in a, in a race against time. We know that we need to have uh, a significant addition, additional uh, acreage of, of wetlands in order to stay ahead of the sea level rise so that by the time we reach a 2100 and presumably some of that sea level rise may have stabilized by that time, that we still have enough of that um, uh, habitat available for those species that are going to be threatened by, by, the, uh, uh, by that wetland otherwise vanishing underneath the waterline. And that's why we can't really wait around. And that's why when we have little delays come up, even as little as five years, uh, that actually is, is, is markedly lost time. So it's critical when you're speaking to your elected officials and candidates. It is uh, election season right now, and a lot of these candidates are available. Ask them where they are, ask them where they stand on this. Ask them if they're receptive to the idea of ensuring that we not only have additional uh, wetland restored to Mission Bay, but that we uh, take advantage of the opportunity to really restore Mission Bay Park. Uh, that's one of the reasons that we're all here this evening. So I, I wanna get to uh, a couple more questions, uh, but again, let me just uh, reiterate the, the, the talking points, which, and I'll put this on the rewildmissionbay.org website, but thank you, but yeah, improving water quality. That is so critical. And as I indicated earlier, that was one of the highest testing uh, uh, concerns that people had about the water. I've told the story about my wife and I walking around Mission Bay when we lived in Hillcrest 10 years ago and seeing a church doing um, a baptismal ceremony there in view of the storm drain, which means everyone in that church probably got ear infections the next week. So, you know, we don't wanna have that. Uh, we wanna expand public access to our bayfront. Sometimes some areas of the bay that are marked as public aren't necessarily as, as public as they should. This is an opportunity to undo that and ensure that everyone has access to that. Restore that habitat for vulnerable and threatened species that will vanish as sea levels rise, as I indicated. Improve our community's resilience to climate change and sea level rise, making sure that we get things out of the way as sea levels continue to rise and also um, add and improve environmental justice components to the park because of the area's long history of indigenous use from Kumye communities whom uh, Andrew had mentioned at the beginning of our presentation. We have an opportunity to do that too as well at this park. It's so extraordinary what we can do with this and get this on par with Balboa Park and it doesn't even involve building a Ferris wheel. So we really have some great opportunities here at Mission Bay Park. Um, Andrew and Isabel and Karina, I, I will uh, turn it over to you. If you see any other questions that you want to address before we uh, go to wrap things up. Yeah, thanks, Tommy. Um, Isabel had asked a question um, uh, of Kiara. Kiara, can you just remind us of the water board's beneficial uses components that, um, that tie in to a project like this? I'm not sure how specific you can be, but that would be a good reminder. Sure. Um, the, the water board isn't just interested in water quality in the chemical sense. We, we protect water quality for the purpose of what we call beneficial uses. Um, two of the beneficial uses that we very much protect are contact and non-contact recreation. So um, the whole reason this SEP is, is happening is because the city of San Diego had a very large sewage spill to Mission Bay, um, which obviously closed Mission Bay for a prolonged period of time, affecting contact recreation. Um, those are the high bacteria levels that Patrick was talking about. Uh, so talking about rec being a, how this SEP improves recreational uses, talking about how this SEP, the other beneficial uses we have are what I lump together, there's different ones, but basically uh, wild, rare, endangered species, all of those uh, as they are connected, basically water quality dependent endangered species, rare threatened endangered species, all of those are part of our beneficial uses uh, that our board is interested in. So to the extent that you can address that, like you guys just did today, that's fantastic. Um, our board is already very much a supporter of the rewild effort. They uh, have a prior resolution. It was already on our preferred or strongly support list of SEP projects. 
um, if I were to, and again, I don't get to, uh, I'm what's called the prosecution team. We're the ones that deliver the package for the board to decide. They're more like the jury. And um, so I, I, I haven't had conversations with them to predict what they might have, but based on what I know our board to be like, if they do have any concerns about the SEP, it would just be that the, um, the, the I'm going to call it the wildest, but basically the maximized restoration planning component is just a planning component. So I think your presence, your sheer volume, this group will speak so much to your commitment to continuously follow through with the city on each one of the um, public speaking or public comment opportunities to make sure that 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 planning components gets followed through and increases the likelihood that the maximum restoration actually happens. Thank, Thank you, Char. You. That's wonderful. And you know, uh, we'll blog out your remarks on that because we, we've been recording this this evening. So that's, that, that's, that's great. And we really appreciate that, that additional um, uh, insight. Um, one other item before we, uh, we get on to wrapping things up, at, uh, so someone asked about the golf course and uh, you know this was something that we were talking about over the summer and uh, the allocation of funds regarding that and no there was there was nothing new on that uh, that I've seen the money was allocated as part of the uh, as part of the uh, the most recent city budget and it's it's specific to the golf course but Andrew could you touch on real quickly what exactly that was going to cover as part of the golf course because uh, we were concerned about that, including uh, the new a new irrigation system, and that was not part of that, correct? It was just the clubhouse. Yeah, um, yeah, good question. Um, obviously, there's uh, lots of other community uses that are in the park now and, and should stay there and, and could stay there, even with a substantial wetland restoration, uh, um, wetland restoration occurring. Um, so the one of them is uh, is the golf course, obviously. One uh, another one is camp land and, and the camping opportunities that are provided there. And then there's turf grass and volleyball courts and tennis courts. And there's space to run around and there's a bike path and those kinds of things. So there's a lot that the city wants to and needs to fit into um, this community park, uh, this um, uh, regional park. Um, on in. In the city's budget, we didn't play. We didn't have a part in that. Um, as the timeline set, uh, went through, the city released this step as a way to fund that what we were hoping for in July, right after the city budget, budgeting process um, was done. Within that city budgeting process, there was funds allocated to a capital improvement project for the golf course, and I, I, I'm not I'm not up on all of the components to it, but it was to um, restore or tear down and build a new temporary clubhouse for the golf course as, as far as I understand that was the simple um, explanation of it at least so it also um, is potentially uh, something that still could happen still could uh, a temporary golf clubhouse while the city is planning for this area is um, is is what the city budget decided to do the city uh, leaders decided to do um, we've been advocating and asking for them to hold off any big investments in this area while we are planning, while the city is, is leading this planning process. And um, so we'll, we'll keep pushing that and make sure that they hear loud and clear that um, that long-term uh, investments in this area aren't ready, aren't the right time to do it while the pandemic is happening and all, those, all that um, layer on top of this, but also while the planning process is underway. Okay, good. Um, th thank you for um, fleshing that out a bit, Andrew, because that was one of the big messaging things that we were uh, working on this summer. So it's uh, getting to be quarter of, uh, I want to wrap this up, but I want to uh, give uh, one last opportunity to uh, Isabel and um, Karina and also Patrick to give any remarks. Um, uh, Isabel, was, was there anything else that you wanted to conclude with uh, before uh, and have people think about as far as the 14th goes? Um, I think that it would be, it would be so helpful um, now that I, I've heard from Karen and, and been reminded that it's beneficial uses that, um, you know, we're, they're really concerned with. I think it, it, you know, for all of you who know the Kendall Frost Marsh or have seen it or been to Love Your Wetlands Day, that that um, support that comes from your your heart, your soul for 
and your um, your academic training as to um, the need for you know expanded wetlands um, I think will be very very helpful so to you know color what you say in terms of um, taking the talking points that are posted but I think really showing that what as Kiara suggested showing that we're a community that will really continue to push for this in the most um, scientifically um, accurate and um, um, you know su supported way thanks Karina uh, is there anything else that uh, that you would like to add as we uh, we wrap things up any closing remarks or, or thoughts yes uh, we need to be doing this because we need more wetlands in San Diego. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and, uh, and Patrick, was there anything that, that you wanted to add as well? Um, I think Isabel did a great job of summing that up and thank you, Kiara as well for kind of refocusing the, the, I guess the, the, the main points that the water board itself will be, um, focusing in on the beneficial uses are very important so just appreciate having that input but i don't have anything else to add thank you to, to everybody else this is a great discussion a lot of awesome information in here wonderful wonderful thank you well so we've been recording this uh we will make this available by the way that uh, ridgeways rail video that isabel was showing earlier uh that was the video that broke the internet on our youtube so we'll try and see if we can post the whole enchilada from this meeting and, and break the internet again We'll get, we'll get it out to you in, in, in some capacity uh, before the 14th. Uh, we'll get some more blog uh, pieces out in the meantime as well. But thank you again to, uh, to Patrick, to Isabel, to Karina. And uh, a big thank you as well to Jen, by the way, who is uh, working everything behind the scenes. And also thank you to Andrew. And thank you to all of you for making time to join us this evening. It was uh, great seeing everyone. Uh, Kara, thank you for your input and joining us as well uh, and bringing the additional information. And we'll see you all on the 14th. Thanks for your time. Have a nice evening.